Good morning everyone and happy book day. Okay, so you can obviously see, I've come dressed as somebody. Who do you think I've come dressed as? Not gonna give any clues away. Um, God has just come up there. Okay, so uh, we left our last paragraph. Our last chapter was behind bars. And that was when he thought he definitely wanted to escape. And he said, I, wa I am going to escape. He was very confident with that, wasn't he? So, chapter six. Chapter six is called Tip. Don't know why. Uh, okay, well, let's find out. At first, Jim couldn't tell one boy from another. They had all the same sallow, thin faces and dark, sunken eyes. They all wore the same scratchy grey clothes and caps. They had their hair cropped and combed in exactly the same way, except for the boy who had spoken to him in the yard. His hair had a wild way of his own. He found himself following this boy round because he was the only one he could recognise. But it was a long time before he spoke to him. It was a long time before Jim felt like talking to anyone. He was numb and wrapped up inside himself. But it was one morning in the schoolroom that Tip spoke to him and became the nearest thing to a friend that Jim could ever hope to have. So that's telling us uh, their future relationship, their future friendship is going to be quite strong. The schoolroom where the boys spent every morning was a long, dim room with candles set into every other desk. The little window had been painted over so they couldn't look out. That's a good idea. I think I'll do that. I think I'll paint all the windows so nobody can look out of the windows. Why did they do that? So as to stop children getting distracted. They didn't want anyone looking out. And then the only place they'd be able to look is forward at the teacher. <clears throat> there was a fireplace at one end with sheets steaming around it. So that would be so they could dry. Old women sometimes wandered in to see if the sheets, putting wet ones up and taking down the dry ones, would be packed off back to the big houses. These were the washerwomen. And this was their workhouse job. Washing the clothes of the rich, the women would sit by the fire from time to time, mumbling to each other in low drones during the lessons. Sometimes cackling out remarks to the boys or shouting out the wrong answers to the deaf old schoolmaster's questions. Having a bit of fun. There were four big arches across the ceiling with letters on them. And Mr. Barrack would begin every day by pointing at the arches and then by asking one of the boys to read out the words on them. God is good. God is holy. God is just. God is love. The women would chant out before the boys had a chance, sometimes in the wrong order, just for fun. And they would nudge each other and screech with laughter. One morning when it was Tip's turn to answer the question, he turned to the women and held out his hand for them to speak. They shook their heads and pursed their lips, shaking with silent laughter. And Tip, taken by surprise, laughed out loud. Mr. Barrack, shook by the back of his jacket, half lifted him off the floor. There's nothing to laugh at here, he shouted. No, sir, there ain't, agreed Tip and was given another shaking. The women loved this. For most of the rest of the morning, Mr. Barrack read out loud to the boys, pacing up and down the room as he did so. So the candle flames fluttered in his wake and his black shadow danced on the walls. Curled in his hand was the end of a knotted rope, which he swung as he walked, striking it across the desk from time to time, to make the boys jump awake. Every now and then, he stopped and pointed at a boy, who had to stand up and recite, that means to kind of retell, the sentence he'd just heard. If he got it wrong, 
Mr. Barrack swung the knotted end of the rope across the boy's hand. Do you think that would hurt? I think it would. As a change from reading out loud, Mr. Barrack would shout out to one of the boys to fetch him in. Shabby old copy of Dr. Mavor's spelling primer. He would pounce on any boy. Spell Ch Chibley, he would shout, swinging his rope in readiness. Don't know what that word is. One morning the boys were given chalks and slates to use. A visitor had brought them in as a present. They sat on their desk through the morning and the boys all watched them lovingly, longing to have a go. Because it's just something different, isn't it? <sighs> now you can write, Mr. Barrack told them at last, easing himself onto the high school, the high stool of the desk and grunting with his effort. Tip put up his hand. Please, sir, uh, what should we write? Speak up! What should we write? Mr. Barrett roared back. What should you write? The Lord's Prayer. Prayer, if you please. Jim risked a look round at the boys as they bent to their task, their breath smoking from them into the cold air. He put his elbows on the desk and his head in his hands. He was bleak inside himself. Sort of like empty, lonely and bewildered, bewildered, confused and afraid. Beside him, Tip squeaked his, squeaked his chalk across his slate, scratching out scrawly shapes. His tongue poked out between his lips as he worked. He glanced sideways at Jim. Why ain't you writing? He whispered. Cause I can't. Jim whistled back. I never knew how to write. Core, it's easy. Tip's eyebrows shot up and disappeared into a tangle of his hair. Just wiggle your chalk across the slate like this. His chalk scraped and laboured. There. He leaned back in triumph. Triumph like victory. Like he'd accomplished something. And blew chalk dust off his slate. He showed it to Jim. <clears throat> That's good, Jim agreed. What does it say, though? Tip's amazed eyebrow shot up into his hair again. I don't know. I can't read. Jim spluttered into his hands. <coughs> and Mr. Barrett jerked awake. He hobbled down the aisle towards Jim. Did you laugh then? Jim felt as if he had frozen into his seat. His lips stuck together as if ice had formed between them. No, he didn't. It, it was me. Tip jumped up as the schoolmaster swung his rope in readiness and swished it down across the boy's outstretched hand. The women folding up the sheets by the, the, sheets by the fire cackled. The other boys sat in total silence while this was happening, staring straight in front of them, their arms folded. Mr. Barrack towered over Jim. What did he say to you? Jim forced himself to stand up, his legs trembling like reeds in the wind. He, he, he said he can't read, sir, he whispered, and had to shout it out a few times more until Mr. Barrett could hear him. Can't read! The teacher bellowed. Can't read! I'll say he can't read! What's the use of teaching boys like him to read? What do any of you want with reading or writing, miserable sinners that you are? He pulled Tip's hand towards him again and lashed the rope across it. Boosh! Jim glanced at Tip, afraid to speak. He could see that the boy's eyes were wet and that he was nursing his hand under his armpit. So, what's Tip just done there? He's actually helped Jim. Jim should have been hit. Well, he shouldn't have been hit, should he? But he took the the uh, the pain. He took the uh, the beating from Mister Barrack. So it was like, wow, such a brave thing to do, to protect his 
new friend. Jim Gladstone. <clears throat> right! Mr. Barrett barked, and Jim picked up his chalk and scribbled furiously with it, just as Tip had done. And at the end of that morning, Mr. Barrett told the boys to get out their instruments. And with a great shoving of desks and scuffle of boots, they ran to the big cupboards at the end of the room, only to be shouted at and made to do it all over again in silence. I'd have got hit anyway, Tip muttered to Jim under the noise. His eyes were still wet. Did it hurt? Jim asked him. Tip shook his head. Once Mr. Barrack starts hitting you, Barrack always hits you, he said. He blew his hand and stuck it back under his armpit. Every day if he can, just don't let him have a chance to start. Tell Barrack Tip did it if he blames you for anything. Tip will get hit anyway, so you might as well. A drum was placed on the desk for them to share and Tip stood up and reached out for a stick. At a wave of the schoolmaster's hand, and the hymn tune started, such a thumping and wailing that the washerwomen ran out with their hands over their ears. Was that nothing Jim had ever heard before? Tim poked him with a drumstick and mouthed at him over the route and banged the other side of the drum with it. Jim just tapped it up first. He watched Tip to try to work out some kind of rhythm in the mess of the noise and he saw that all the boys seemed to be chanting something. The little black holes of their mouths opening and closing into the thunder of drums and whistles. So while the candle flames flattened and danced like tiny white devils. What are you saying? Jim shouted as close to Tip's ear as he could get. Tip turned towards him. I hate this place. Jim could hear Tip's voice faint and wailing over the beating of his drum. He had his eyes shut. He thumped the drum in time to every word. I hate this place. Bang, 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 bang. So do I, said Jim. Bang, bang, bang. He closed his eyes and put his head back. He shouted into the darkness, opening up his throat to let all the tightness out. I want Dad! I want Ma! Bang, bang, bang. I want Emily! Bang, bang, bang. I want Liz! Bang, 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 bang. I want to go home! Bang, 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 bang. Mr. Barrett raised his hand and the sound stopped. They said it had been torn away in shreds. Silence. Utter, swirling, hugging silence. <sighs> Jim felt his thoughts tumbling into it and then settling into calm. He felt better. Why did he feel better? What was he doing? How did that help him? And what about Mr. Barrack? What a nasty character he is. But that was very common in the Victorian times. Um, not, yeah, horrible. Yeah, children did, you know, in those places get beat quite a lot. Right, okay, we're going to stop there. And our next chapter would be chapter seven. Okay.